The rest of this I cannot ad lib because he has a lot of credentials, which I am not giving you all of. But Drew is genealogist for the early Vermont Settlers to 1784 study project for the New England Historic Genealogical Society. He is consulting editor for the New England Historical and Genealogical Register. He is a fact checker for Henry Louis Gates' PBS program, Finding Your Roots, that started Tuesday night at 8 o'clock and will continue next week, and it's a terrific show. When time permits, he's editor and researcher for the Brewster Fifth and Sixth Generations, and author and researcher for the next Allerton Sixth Generation Project for the General Society of Mayflower Descendants. And he was manuscripts curator at the New England Historic Genealogical Society. And he was librarian, archivist, and journal editor for the Massachusetts Society of Mayflower Descendants. And for 10 years, he edited the Genealogical Society of Vermont's Journal. So I'm sure anything we need to know about genealogy through us, our man. So thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you very much, Kay. Uh, can everybody see that, or do we want to turn the, yeah. yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Well, normally I start with an introduction about myself, but I think Kay uh, thoroughly did that. I've been doing genealogy professionally since 1984 and as a hobby since 1971. So it's kind of what I do, I guess, is a, a way. It's, it's my hobby and it's my profession as well. So we can't talk about genealogy enough for me. I can talk about it all night long. So any questions you have, we'll have a Q&A at the end. And you can have questions, uh, ask questions about what we talk about here or any other genealogical questions you may have, we can, we can uh, go as long as the library will let us stay here. So this is Tunbridge. Try to get some Tunbridge images in here. We live on Ward Hill, so this is Ward Hill, and it was a fabulous, uh, colorful year this year. So the current projects I'm working on that she mentioned uh, is the Early Settlers of Vermont which is uh, sort of playing to all my strengths and it's, it's a dream job, let's say, because I'm from Vermont, my interest is in Vermont, and it's all about early Vermont families. Sadly, for the first round, Tunbridge won't be in it because Tunbridge was settled later than what the first part that I'm doing. I'm going up to uh, 1771, and I'm starting with the east side of Vermont and then going from there. So the focus today of this lecture, it's introduction to genealogy, but as I said, fair game, any questions you have on any research that you're doing or just general procedures and whatnot. What I hope to impart here is sort of a better way to do genealogy uh, as I see it. Things have changed a lot in the last 10 or 15 years because of the internet. So even the way I go about things is very different than when I started in the 70s. So I assume everyone here has an interest in genealogy, hopefully. Uh, how many have been doing um, genealogy for 10 years or more? A couple of old timers, like five, a few more, one. We got a lot of new people. Well, that's good. That's good. The reason why I ask is also to gear where I'm going to focus on the most in this lecture. So let's get started. So we're just going to talk about some basic principles, only a few of them, and we're at a higher level when we're talking about them. There's going to be more detail that I could probably spend an entire lecture on each one of these topics that we talk about. So realize that what I'm talking about are, are general norms of how we do stuff, but there's usually a caveat for almost everything here, just like there is in life. So, principles of genealogy. This may sound kind of strange, but so many people, myself included, sorry, um, when you first start, kind of jump ahead, because when you first start doing genealogy, and genealogy, by the way, 
I'm going to refer to it mostly as starting with yourself and going backwards, doing your ancestry, because that's what most people do. But there are people, such as my projects and stuff, where you talk about a particular person in history and actually come forward in time. So all their descendants. So either ancestry, which is you know, a different set of surnames every time you go back one generation, or all the same surnames or who they married in going forward to the present time. But a strange rule of thumb, known to the unknown, you really need to have a strong foundation of who you are working on before you try to move back the previous generation. And the biggest pitfall with that generally is similar surnames or, or same surnames. Uh, so you have a John Smith here in Tunbridge and you have a John Smith in, in um, well, Royalton, say, and the one in Royalton disappears right when the one up here appears. Well, logical assumption they might be related, but you have to be very careful with that. That's what I mean about knowing as much as you can about the person you're, you're starting with and then slowly moving forward. So moving from the known to the unknown. And this part is the part that most people uh, seem to forget. It may remind you of high school, college, cite your sources. And it is really, really important, especially when I think of genealogy is the perfect hobby for anybody. It's one that you can spend as much time as you want. You can put it away for a week, two weeks, year, a decade. Yes, start right where you left off and you just move forward. So it's always there, something you can do when you have the time. But when you do that decade hiatus or more, like I have on some of my families, and then you come back to them, and you didn't cite your sources, and I don't know about you, but my memory's not what it used to be. <laughs> So I'm scratching my head trying to figure out where I got some of this information from. And some of it would have been very tantalizing and interesting information if I knew where I got it in the first place. Knowing so much more now than I did then, I could evaluate it better and see if it was useful. But I have actually had some stuff from when I first started that when I came back to it, I was never able to find it again. So I have no idea where it came from. So, citing your sources. So, obvious thing is a book. So, just the author title, and usually publications uh, information, and then the page number is good enough for anybody to find what you uh, need to cite. Second is an example of if it's in a journal. There are many genealogical journals, historical journals that you may use for your research, and ideally, uh, some people just cite this last part, which is fine. You can get your, who's ever looking at your material to where you found it. But this gives you the context of who wrote it and what was it about to start with. So I always say just write the little bit extra and once you've written it, you don't have to write it again. So another example is, and, and this is how things have changed with the internet. As you see, I have a website here is citing to actual documents as opposed to things that are published. So this is uh, a Revolutionary War citation, and this is the official name that the federal government gives it. This is the file number and the person it's about, and this actually goes to the actual page within that probate citing for this. So that's helpful for people, especially nowadays that we do everything with links online. And, and one reason why that is important, too, is the other problem with doing things online is if this thing changes or goes away. I mean, how many of us have had the experience where you're on a website, you have a link, you click a link, and it goes to nothing? Well, it goes to error 404. Are we familiar with error 404? There's a lot of information on that page, because I go to that page all the time. Um, I won't dwell upon it, but there is a. if this site went away, there's actually a place you can go and use this URL 
and get back to it even though it's, that company is folded or has changed the URL, you can actually get back to this point. Uh, let's see, oh, and so uh, another example here, this is just from a newspaper. Newspaper, you wanna always put the full name, where it's from, where it was published, and then just the issue it was in and the page number it's on. I should mention too, the blue piece of paper that uh, Kay gave out, or the girls gave out up front, that this is an outline of what we're covering. I just wanna mention at the bottom are any of the URLs that I'm going to mention, you don't need to write them down because they're already on your handout. And then, of course, you've got the back side if you want to write notes on. But don't worry about URLs. You're covered. It should be on your sheet. So the next thing I want to talk about is types of sources. So this says primary versus secondary sources. Does anybody have an idea of what the difference between these two are? Or, or what is a primary source? Diary. A diary. Do you know why that's a, a primary source? Written by the person himself. Or something. Written by the person himself. Anybody else? Birth certificates. And yeah. And why would that be a primary source? Because it's the actual information. Yeah, it's the event. It, it's the recording of the event generally within its when it happened. Yeah. So that's the definition for primary resource. It doesn't mean that secondary sources aren't handy and useful in genealogy, but you very often want to have the primary source, especially if you find conflicts. But you can even find conflicts and wrong information in primary sources. So, a primary source is a first-hand testimony or some direct evidence of an event that usually happened within a reasonable amount of time of when it was recorded. There are other um, forms of this. You know, you can have, so birth certificate, you can have a digital version of that that was made, you know, in 2000 of the birth certificate that's 50 years old, well, that's still considered a primary source. Uh, there are verbatim transcripts <laughs> or just general abstracts. And those depend on how they were done, but generally they're accepted as a reasonable uh, source for primary versus a secondary source. So let's give a, a couple examples here. So this is... Um, Gravestone, and this is in Ward Hill uh, Cemetery. So on it, we see, let me see, I have bifocals here, so. <laughs> okay, so it's the wife of Jason, it's uh, Sarah Dutton, wife of Jason Brewer. Died in 1884. This is the vital record card index from the state of Vermont. How many people have seen these or used these? Just a couple. Mm -hmm. So Vermont had town clerks copy all their information out of their town books and also cemeteries up to a certain point. And then they put them on these cards and then the state created an alphabetical index to them. It's also available online, but you can get it on microfilm up at the state archives in Middlesex. So. You can see this has a little bit different information. So this, well, this still tells us she's a Dutton, but this has parents. It also has her, well, this one has age right there too. So which one's more primary, would you think? Gravestone or this index card? Gravestone. Gravestone, everybody agree with that? Okay, um, this is a little bit of a trick question. This would be the more primary one, mainly because it's coming from the record as it happened in the town book. This is a secondary source of it, and there are some issues with that, but <clears throat> this would be considered primary, mainly because gravestones, we think of them as being created right after somebody dies or, or manufactured. I've seen, actually I was working on a project uh, for, uh, a sketch that I was doing for the project, 
and it was somebody who died in 1803, and the stone was erected, and it actually said this on the stone, erected by the great-grandchildren in 1906. So um, I find these especially earlier than this. So this is 1884. The earlier you go, the more likely you're t going to have a pause in them. And how many of you have seen gravestones that have more than one person, not just husband and wife, but may have other names on there? And you can usually tell at the carving to see if they were carved all at once or if they were carved and, and additions were made. Because if they're carved all at once, what does that mean? Yeah, it's later because all the information was done at once. And you often see these with children, especially when you have the little children. You, you, have you all seen the gravestones that go like this? They usually have several bumps, two, three, four, five. Those are generally kids who are all dying within a year. Usually scarlet fever or something like that coming through. And the little bump ones, so the information for the earliest, the, peop the kids dying the... Uh, first are less likely to be true and I see dates on these wrong all the time and years not generally the rest of the stuff you know like this husband and her name I generally don't see that but occasionally you do as well so it's the card on the right oops I just hit I've not used PowerPoint on this particular machine before Okay, so now we're going for the next example. So here we have one of those cards again. And the two examples that I had, so the previous one was from Vital Records and this one is from Vital Records as well. This is from Tunbridge. And this is, I can tell you, is very unusual to have up at the top, this little line right here. They generally never have it. That's why I have this as an example. And this is from the town, uh, Tunbridge Town Clerk's Records. Um, so which one, the card or this book, which do we think's more likely the primary? Book. The book. And the reason why is this was done at the time you generally can tell this is all, because it's all one big family here. They usually have a recording date at the bottom. This one doesn't. But I chose this one as an example mainly because these cards from the state index Generally don't have this, which says, does it say Stonington? I think it does. And uh, if you look, yes, Stonington, because here it is right here. Because this is the guy right here that's on this card. So normally, in the beginning, I'd say up to about 1820s, 1830s is when you don't see it anymore, is a family will be recorded all at once. Generally after they think is the last child. Every once in a while you'll see a big chunk of them and then you have one or two added because, oops, had another one. But, so this is recorded all at the same time and this gives you somewhat of a problem because depending on where they got this from, if it came from their own family Bible or something, their memory, you know, these dates are less likely to be accurate than the ones down here at the bottom where it was recorded. But in Vermont, what I wanted to point out was born Preston, well that's Preston, Connecticut. She's born Stonington, Connecticut. Stonington, Stonington, born at Tunbridge. So here's the first one that's born Tunbridge. So obviously they moved to Tunbridge between 1784 and 1786. That's what I like about these kind of records is when they record the whole family like that, they record all of them regardless of where they're born. And they usually say where they're born. They don't always, because I've seen some of these that will have this kind of record and and say just off the cuff, Tunbridge first settler was 1785, and all this just says born. It's like, well, I don't think they were born here, such as the 1763 at the top. So let's say, and this, the other details don't matter. Let's say we have a statement for somebody who was born in 1834. And we have two sources, and the sources differ on what the date is. The first one is a genealogy, and, and the genealogies don't matter necessarily, but this, an old genealogy, this was published in 1860. Or we have one of these, this is a modern genealogy, this is actually a colleague of mine, well-documented, footnoted, and all that 
the whole shebang. This is actually more than most are. Um, and they have a difference in the birth date. Would you believe the first one or the second one? This one will probably just have dates, may have places. This will have footnotes and all the other kind of thing. Which one would you, would you uh, think might be a better choice? Second. Second one? Because? Footnotes. Footnotes. Anybody else? We all going for number two? Yes. Number one. <laughs> and the only reason, number two could be, it depends on what the footnote says. A lot of them aren't footnoted as well as they could be, but the reason why is this was done in the lifetime of the person. And I can tell you from uh, being a librarian, I was a librarian and archivist at the New England Historic Genealogical Society, and we often had the collections of these authors of the early genealogies. How did they get the information? Well, they wrote to them, and they wrote back in a letter and say, I was born on this date, on this time, in this place. So that's why in, in things that are in memory lifetime, so either the person was born uh, living in this time or close to it, sometimes these older genealogies are actually better sources. Otherwise, I would go with your argument because of the footnotes, if, if it's done well, if it's done scholarly, the footnote should actually say where it comes from. So those were a little bit trick questions. So we were talking about genealogies, published genealogies there. And so when do you use genealogies in local histories? So I was just telling you that you want to go to the primary source whenever possible. That is true with one exception when you're first starting out. Once you have a person identified to your satisfaction, then it's often quicker to go to a genealogy or a local history who's, who's looking at a whole community or an entire family, especially with common surnames, you know, Joseph Smith or something just down the pike there, sorting out all the Joseph Smiths. These genealogies generally have done a lot more work than you'll ever do to try to sort out which one is which. So as an example, and I, and I lead into this because of the last one we were talking about, so this is one of these forms. This is uh, on Brewster. As you heard, I've been working on these. So there's a two-volume work published in 1900 on the grandsons of the uh, famous William, Elder William Brewster. The woman was going to do two more volumes on the granddaughters and all their descendants. She had done all the work, so this had been sent out to various people she knew were related, and had them fill out the information. So on this one, I didn't, it's a very long sheet. The sheet would probably go down to about here. And at the bottom, it's signed and dated by the person who gave this information. So, you know, you're getting pretty decent information on this. And it is, looking for dates, 1790s. This was done in, um, this was sent in in 1898. It was sent in by this guy right here. So he's the one that provided all the information for his family. And in these books, this was back when they didn't footnote or, or say the sources, but this is the source behind it because this is how the only way they had for doing genealogies for the most part. You know, if I'm doing a genealogy of a particular family and I live here in Tunbridge and the family's all over Vermont, New Hampshire, and who knows where else, you know, back then you didn't go, oh, I'll get in my car and go over and look at the vital records, which they may or may not have had open at the time. You wrote to people. So it's the correspondence in these collections and manuscript collections behind the authors that have some of the value that if you have a problem with something that you found and in a book says something else, you might find a letter in the collection that says, oh, well, I gave that information and... I should know, it's me. So this is um, generally how these kind of books were created, and some local histories were done that way as well, the genealogy sections of writing around. So the key importance of these two types is it gives you a broader view of 
the subject at hand, whether a particular person or a family, and lets you know how they're related either to the place in the local histories or the family in the larger picture. So that's why they're useful. Generally what I do is I start by getting some primary records of the person I'm working on. Once I'm satisfied that everything is gelling, you know, all the things make sense, because sometimes they don't, as long as they make sense, then I go to genealogies and see if anybody's ever written anything on this family. And then I use that as an outline, and then I try to prove or disprove everything they say, because that's the kind of guy I am. <laughs> but, uh, and that's getting back to the footnotes and knowing where you, come, where you got all the data from. So that's about sources and the difference between primary and secondary, and then um, just sources you're going to use. Now let's talk about writing it up, or at least presenting it to different people. So this is, this is one of mine. This is my great-grandfather in North Springfield. So when did I do this? 84. So that, that's probably about the last time I did this stuff. And at the time, I used to do it this way, even though the convention is the other way. I was doing it this way because Vermont vital records are always done year, month, day. Because you're more likely to know the year than the month. And you're more likely to know the month than the day. So I thought it was logical, too. But uh, scholarly genealogy does it the reverse way, which is a European way of doing dates. So you know, where is one here? So this one here would be 3rd of April, 1793 instead. So using charts, handwritten or otherwise, the benefit of using charts like this is as you're navigating through and trying to see where things are going, you can see a very broad spectrum of the family all in one place, all at one time. And you know, it's just visually you can find where you're going. And if you notice, well, this one doesn't show it so much. This is chart eight, but um, this one here, is always um, the newer charts, these old ones don't have it, the newer charts would have chart and position, where they came from. So chart eight would be from, if you start with me, would be, so this would be two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it'd be this position here. The newer types of these forms actually have that on it, so you can go back and forth between charts. As you notice, here's chart 58, if I would, what it would do is take this William Oney, he'd be here with the full data, and then you'd go, just go back in all of his lines here. So this is ancestry again, as we we're talking about, going backwards in time. Then there's genealogical programs, and they usually have a whole bunch of forms. Uh, this is a very simple one. This is PATH, Personal Ancestral File, which actually is no longer produced. It was produced by the Mormons in Salt Lake City, and it was free. And I like it because it's a quick, it's an easy program to quickly put data in. But you can have it in this form, and you can also have this display where it displays the birth, marriage, and death, like what I was doing on the hand version that I showed you. But this also toggles over to a screen like this, or you can just look on information on the individual yourself. And generally, the programs are all done this way. So the last way is to do it the old-fashioned way that a lot of people don't think about it. Um, oh, well, one thing that I forgot to mention. On the computer form, one reason why that is useful and easy is because most of us have laptops, and you can come and take it wherever you're doing research. You'll have all your data with you. You can also use it because it has data. You can do sorts on and say, oh, I have these three different families on three different charts in Tunbridge, so I can go to Tunbridge and I can look at all three of these families and hopefully learn more about them. So the computer de genealogical databases are useful for that purpose of seeing what research you have and where you need to go. And being portable. Because for the few of you that have done this for a while, I'm sure you used to have nice big notebooks that you'd carry along with you and you'd have all your charts or your data files. It's not so easy to do anymore, and some places won't let you take that in because it's paper and they've got paper and they don't want them mixed. So a word processor or typewriter is the way we used to do it. I'm so glad that's over. You know, you type and then if you make a mistake or you have a big addition, you have to type over the whole page again, insert what you want and go on to the next page. 
So this is an example of ancestral. So the subject is here, these are his parents, and then it's written as to what information we had with footnotes. So that's an ancestral type. That's the one that often people do, and most people don't think you can do it in a chart like this, but you can in a word processing form. So in that form, number one, regardless of male or female, the father is double the number. The mother's number is double plus one. So once you leave the very first person, all the numbers, the women's are, are odd and the men are even. And that's how it goes as far back as you go, however you do that. So that's going ancestral type. And this is descendancy. This is an example of one that I'm working on. And so I'm talking, I, I'm starting with these immigrants into Vermont and going down all their children. Either way, whichever type of project you're doing, this one doesn't have that example, but this one did and why I showed you. So <laughs> I've still been compiling this just from notes that I've had over a couple dozen years. And I'm finally writing it all up to see where I'm going. And why you write it up is you start finding, oh, there's a hole here, that, that fact's missing. And um, I think there's another one too. There's a whole bunch of uh, comments, there's one. The other one might be right here, so <laughs> I think that's where it was. But anyway, it shows you where, what you're missing. Writing it up is very handy because you may think you've research, researched it to the nines. Once you start writing it, writing it actually shows you anything you've missed. It, it becomes very apparent very quickly when you write it up. So I use writing it up which is the point that most people kind of stay away from as my way of knowing if I've covered everything because it becomes blatantly obviously obvious in the text when you've missed something. So that's why I do writing up. So we've talked about sources for a number of times and I do them in, I have roughly three tiers that I do them in. First here, I think every genealogy should be done this way. You know, as a minimum, these are the things you should be checking. And mainly the reasons why those things are on the list is most of them are primary sources and they're easily accessible and indexed. And that's why you should use them. There's no reason not to because they're easily accessible. So first tier is, this is an example. I think this one's, oh, this is Springfield. Um, so this is one of my family. Um, this is a town record just like we were looking at in Tunbridge. So you want to use vital records. You'll also want to use probate. This is a probate example. So this is, uh, yeah, it's Daniel... Duck. Yeah, Calhoun. So probates generally have easy indexes to use and well, we're in Orange County. I should say I, I fo have focused more on Windsor County. Windsor County has an index for the entire county, which my mother and I produced years ago. Um, we were hoping to do the whole state, but that never materialized. But generally, there are indexes that are useful and easy to get to. Other such things are censuses, U.S. censuses, which are online in a variety of places. Also with decent indexes, and we talked about once you've identified people, genealogies and local histories. To me, you haven't done justice to what you're treating until you've used at least those sources on every person that you deal with. So that's what I call tier one. So tier two gets into records that are a little bit harder to use, and the first example is that's a deed, and the reason why deeds are a little bit harder to use, especially in Vermont, do you know the difference uh, between Vermont and <coughs> Vermont and Rhode Island, I should say, with the rest of the United States, as far as deeds go? Does anybody know what's peculiar about Vermont and Rhode Island? They're on the town level. Sounds normal to us because I, I assume most everybody here grew up here. Most every other state does it on the county i.e. you get a whole bunch of towns all together so you can 
cover more things. Because how often is someone, you know, they're on the edge, like where we live on Ward Hill, we're almost into Royalton. Our mail is Royalton. We're associated with Royalton because we're closer to that village than we are to this one. And likewise with vital records and probates, those things sometimes slipped over in the other direction. Of course, this can't, deeds can't because they have to be for the district that they are being recorded in. So deeds are one of them. Tax lists are another. Sometimes they're in the town record books. Sometimes they're separate. This is a uh, Grafton um, church record. So church records in town are another good source. Local, his, uh, local cemetery work and online newspapers. And online newspapers has made it from tier three to tier two because they're now starting to digitize a lot. And we will talk about them more later, but they, you have access to them online in ways we never had before. So newspapers should be <laughs> fairly high on your list. So <laughs> tier one, adequate, minimum, everybody should do it. Tier two, you're getting a pretty good genealogy at this point as, uh, ones that close enough to like win awards so you see these uh, genealogies being put out. So tier three is everything else that's a little bit harder to get at. So first is uh, court records. Court records are a lot harder to use. Indexes, they're there, but sometimes they're hard to use. This, is, this one's actually an example of a prison record, which comes out of the courts anyway. But if you see on this, so this has his birthplace, birth date, um, that he has one surviving daughter, so it sounds like he's widowed. Um, and then down here it says he has a sister living. Not the kind of information you get in other places, and it gives uh, other information. It gives his religion, what he does for work, what his education level is, and it can go on. And each court record is different, but Court records are a lot harder to use. In Vermont, they're getting easier because you used to have to go to all the different court courthouses to do them. And they're being collected, at least the oldest records, in the state archives in Middlesex. I've been talking about manuscripts, being a manuscript <laughs> curator. So the difference with a manuscript, a manuscript, does anybody know the difference between a manuscript and a book? Say that again? You, you guys have been almost right every time. So. <laughs> it is one of a kind. This is it. You can have limited copies. Manuscripts can be like mimeographs or other ways we do. Not published, not mass produced. So this is a manuscript, <clears throat> and this happens to be one of my ancestors here. He's in Middletown Springs, Vermont, I believe. Or his kids end up there anyway. And this is the only thing on this family that I've ever been able to find. Nothing published ever mentions this guy. And this manuscript goes into detail on him and uh, his immediate family in Vermont. So manuscripts, they're just hard to find. You don't always know where they're going to be. So this is on a Vermont family, but it's in Boston. Other things would be photograph collections that you can have in a local historical <laughs> society. Um, Universities have generally research facilities that collect material like this. So you never know where this kind of stuff is going to appear. So now for the, the big part, the one that everyone goes for. Well, where can I go? What can I do? How can I do it? Well, you always start with your own records you may have in your, in your immediate family, in your house. So this happens to be a copy of a family Bible on my particular family, my mother's side of the family, and uh, my great aunt had it. And I knew she had it, everybody in the family knew. <laughs> this is what started me working on this family. Because here it is, it gives me um, when they're born, when they're married, of course it doesn't give me places, that's the challenge, and then all the kids. So there I'm starting off and didn't even leave the house. Well, didn't leave my aunt's house anyway. So start with things you have that you may have received from your parents 
or uh, other people interested in genealogy. Oftentimes when I'm doing the Bartley ones, um, I send them a copy of their immediate family or, or part of the work that I'm doing that covers their side of the family. You may have those kind of things as well. So start at home. And I left this blank because this is where um, it depends where you live and what you're researching. The other place to go is local historical societies if you're studying in that area. I'm from Springfield, so I started there first. The historical society, the town library, they had a, a fair amount of information <coughs> on my family. But if you're living in Tunbridge and your family's in Bennington or in Boston or something, obviously you can't go easily to the local library, but that should be on your list down the way. <coughs> So places to go around here, Baker Library in Dartmouth has a large collection of local histories and genealogies of northern New England. It's a, they're part of their social science collection. And I haven't been there in a while, but uh, it used to be you could just go in. There wasn't any <coughs> issues with you getting any material there. Likewise, Bailey Howe Library at UVM <coughs> in Burlington also has a large published collection and manuscript collection. And they have manuscripts from all over the state. So, like this gentleman was talking about diary, uh, last time I was up there I was looking at one thing and then saw this index reference to another thing and it was a diary from my hometown in the 1830s. I never heard of it. It's not mentioned in any anybody's uh, histories about the town. They didn't know about it. Ended up at UVM. So universities are generally a good place to go if, if they're in the region where you're researching. <coughs> so the big places to go, and this is you know, moving out of the state, New England Historic Genealogical Society, where I used to work and I'm doing the study project for, is the oldest genealogical library in the country. Started in 1847. So because they were the first place, they're, they're actually um, a child of the Massachusetts Historical Society, which is the oldest historical society in the country. So they started collecting all kinds of history, and then a whole core group said, there's enough of us, we want to do genealogy, and they started this library just down the street. Tons of stuff on Vermont, tons and tons of stuff on Vermont. So. That's why I don't come up to Baker Library as much because usually the information is going to be here for me. Yes, sir. Where are they located? This is in Back Bay, so it's at 99101 Newbury Street. So right in the grid pattern. Yeah, Clarendon. It's on the corner of Clarendon and Newbury Street. It's just down from the uh, Public Garden, and it is um, eight floors of books man and manuscripts with a professional staff that you can ask all kinds of questions. So this is the big leader in New England and this the whole Northeast, although they cover the entire country. And because of their age, you get things here, especially in manuscripts that you can't get anywhere else. But then the next step up, the largest genealogical library in the country, and probably in the world, I've never actually tested that, but probably in the world, is the Family History Library in Salt Lake City. So, as you can see, this is just where you can look up stuff in their catalog or things they have in, in um, online. And this is just one of four floors, and they have that many computers. And you can see in the background, so those cabinets probably go back, um, I would say, uh, the length of this room, almost double the length of this room, each one of those rows, microfilms of records from all over the world. So you're talking several million reels of film with a single reel easily can have four or five different record items on it. You know, like Tunbridge, it could have like five volumes worth of Tunbridge records on one film. So that's the big place to go. 
And what I like to say when I'm out there and, and some friends of mine might be teasing me, they'll text me, so where are you working in the world today? Because, you know, oh, well, this morning I was working in Finland, but, you know, this afternoon I thought I'd go to uh, Vermont, so I'm working on Vermont records. You can literally go anywhere in the world there. So that's the amazing thing about that. Excuse but, me. yes? Are the Tunbridge records in that library? Yes. So the question was, are, are the Tunbridge Library, uh, some of them, not all, everything. They generally, when they first, the first round they went through microfilming records and they started in the 40s, 1940s. They generally microfilmed up to about 1850. <clears throat> They've gone back through Vermont and did a lot of town records from 1850 to 1900 and the land records. And I got them to Admit, and, and they have with Vermont, is because Vermont is the only state with open access to literally every record there is. So if you were born yesterday, that might be an exam, uh, a little extreme, but if you were born yesterday, that is now a public record, you could go see it. It's not like that in almost every other state. And this goes, the only thing that gets closed, to my knowledge, is um, adoption records. And even those automatically are opened after 99 years, and they have mechanisms to open them much, much earlier than that. Not so in other states. So my big issue, when so I learned <laughs> using Vermont as my guide of how to research, and I was used to going anywhere I wanted, anytime I wanted, to see any record I wanted. And then I started going to New York which is almost the opposite of Vermont, where so many things are closed, vital records. The worst one I found is Alaska. My grandfather died up there, and he died in 1970, and his death record is still not open. It's like, he's dead. <laughs> he's dead, as a matter of fact, all of his kids except for two are dead. So, yeah, it's just interesting. So now let's Oh, yes. Um, is everything in Salt Lake City online now? And what is, <coughs> and what is it? And is that the same as the IGI? <clears throat> so, two questions. Is everything that Salt Lake City has online? Not even close. This little bit. And there's a lot of good stuff, and that's what we're going to talk about next. <clears throat> What's available online? And IGI. IGI was stands for International Genealogical Index, and it was an index that they were creating to help people get to where they needed for different vital records. Very useful. I still use it from time to time for some reasons, but it's almost been superseded, not quite. And uh, by the stuff going online. The stuff that was indexed in their index is now online and indexed. So, so where to go? online sources, so as you can see from this beautiful painting of Tunbridge, where, where can you go by staying right here in Tunbridge? So we're going to talk about online uh, places, and these are the ones, the URLs are all on your sheet here, so you don't have to worry about copying that down. Every one that I mentioned is on there, and then some more, and we'll talk about those. So Ancestry.com, this is the one that probably everyone knows if you've watched any PBS and see the guy and the little leaf coming up, which I am often teased about. Oh, have you seen a leaf lately? Um, they are helpful hints, I should say. So Ancestry, by far the biggest genealogical database. The caveat is, is one of the more expensive ones. It has the worst indexing, by far, of any of them. It, from what I understand, if they have successful indexing for about 80% of a collection, they consider it good enough. And for genealogy, and we're always going after the little minutia, there's 20% there that I want to look at. And Ancestry is the, the big elephant in the room, and they're slowly, you know, like they bought up these. These used to be independent ones. Ancestry now owns them. They're not part of this database, but um, you can get multiple subscriptions. This shows you some of the new stuff that's coming on. 
And if it doesn't say new here, it means they've added to the collection. And then you get, they have all the US census, and basically every site has all the US censuses. So their indexing isn't the highest quality, but they have such a massive amount of stuff. And I use this every day, every day. And sometimes I search on stuff here because <laughs> the way they can do searches on their indexes is better than other people. So the indexing may not be good, but the index searches is good. So that's the catch with that. So family, family search, this is the product of the Family History Library out in Salt Lake City. And you can do these ge generic searches. And, and I should say on all these that I show you, I've just done a snapshot so you can see the top part, but all of these, you know, the pages just go down and down and down. Like this one has a whole map system underneath as well. But you can see I've already used this link. I go directly to this to look for records at a specific point, specific place or specific time. That's the way I generally do mine. So though not as large as Ancestry.com, eventually this one probably will be. This is free. And uh, so there's a whole bunch of ways to go about searching here, which we won't go to, into now. But the interesting thing with this, because there's so much in here, remember, this is, this is the uh, portal to the largest li genealogical library in the world. You put in Joseph Smith here, you've got a million or more hits, that kind of thing. So the things to know about, this is the historic, what they're calling historical records. It, mine always comes up to that. You can search for that. Genealogies are, um, IGI is in there, and a few other things like that. Indexes that they created way back when we first started using computers to help aid genealogy. That's what's under there. Catalog is the catalog of all those microfilms and all the books they have as well. And books are books that they've actually digitized that may be in copyright, but they get permission to have a copy online so you go into their catalog, and you, there'll be a link in the catalog record that says, would you like to see this book or a copy to the book? You hit that link, and then it loads up the book. So, and then uh, the wiki, which is a project they had me work on, and quality varies all over the place on this, but some are really, really good, and I use all the time, and others I don't even bother to go see. So... Um, are we all familiar with what wikis are? Okay, Have, has everyone heard of Wikipedia? Okay, this wiki is for genealogy and history subjects, and history subjects related to genealogy. So you could actually go and put in Tunbridge, Vermont, and there might be a page for it. I can tell you there's one for the county at least, and it'll tell you what records there are for the county, tips on researching, Vermont isn't really done well, and uh, hopefully they'll hire me back to go do that, because I did the Massachusetts one. That's what they wanted me to do first. And they said, when you get that done, then we'll let you do Vermont. And the project ended. <laughs> teasing me, just teasing me. <clears throat> American Ancestors is the website for, as you can see here, the New England Historic Genealogical Society. Their page doesn't show it much, but these are all drop-down menus. So you can actually search databases, search the catalog. They have uh, also imagery up like Family History Library does, the uh, Family Search, where they have individual records up. They also have links to books as well, even some that only they have. So, uh, and then browse, you can just browse the collections as opposed to search them, and services are the many things that they do there, education, there's uh, research service and the like. Find a grave. There are several grave information ones, but this is the one I use the most because there's so much more in it than everything else. So this one, when I took the shot, 38 million entries in this, and it's mostly the United States. It's not exclusively. It goes all over the world. Uh, no, I shouldn't say. It's like five or six countries right now. But the U.S., so the Ward Hill picture that I showed you, I went 
down a couple of years ago and I photographed every gravestone in there and I put it up here. I've done two other cemeteries, I just haven't loaded them up. But almost every cemetery in this town at least has some photographs of the cemetery stones in them. Fold 3 is, or this is the one that's now owned by Ancestry. It used to be independent, and the main thing that they focused on was military records from the National Archives. So you can see some of them, because like I said, the page keeps going down here. I'm always dwelling in this period, but you've got all of these Revolutionary War records. They've got pay records, muster rolls, they have the pensions, they have all that kind of stuff. And this is the site where um, there has been a effort in the genealogical community to pay, so it's individuals like us donating money to pay to get the War of 1812 pension records up. And they've been digitizing those for quite some time, and they're up to, I think it's M, N, somewhere around there, and they, they've done them alphabetically, so, so uh, you can get those, and those are for free. This is a paid website. But uh, certain things are free. So the War of 1812 pension records, because people like you and me paid for it, we funded them to do it. So it's free to the public. And there are other projects like that. This is one of the many uh, newspaper databases. This, I, I point at this one because this one is the big one for the oldest stuff. So it says 1692. I think it goes up pretty recent. Uh, recent past. Their focus is basically 1850 and before. They have stuff newer than that. They have, when I was researching in Boston, making the wiki about what newspapers, they had every paper except for one. And we're talking about three or four dozen newspapers, all digitized and searchable here. And you can search, you know, you can put a date in a very, various ways. You can just go by the newspaper itself where it was published, either the state or actually the city, if you want to just go by a city or town. Article types, they have about a dozen um, designations for everything that's in the newspaper. Some of them are fairly generic, but so death notices, marriage notices, those are separate entries, so you could just click that and you're only going to get those. And then, of course, languages. I mentioned the second one because this does small, tends to do smaller places. It doesn't focus uh, as much on the older stuff. But as you see, this one gives you, so their newspapers, they have 1.8 billion pages of newspapers. Again, mostly US, not all. And then they have these other subsections that they've been doing of just the more recent obituaries, and those are being fed in. Now, a lot of the funeral homes and stuff feed into a database that then goes into this, and other places, too. This one you can't do as detailed research, and when you uh, search, but when you put data in here, then you search, after it gives you results, you can actually refine it a little bit more as well. So there are other ones, that one that I didn't mention, there are several on here that I have not mentioned, but the other one for newspapers is called Chronicling America, and this is done by the Library of Congress, and they focus on 1836 to 1922. I'm not sure why they got 1836, but basically what it is is the very first newspaper website that I showed you, they basically are capturing from the end of that forward. So, and, well, maybe I should, let's see. So that's the end of this presentation. The only couple of things I want to, I'll just mention the few here that are, that I didn't mention before. A Civil War database that lets you know uh, where people served. Uh, Daughters of the American Revolution, DAR, they have databases for some of their records. And Internet Archives. So this is the big place that I go to for books that are out of copyright, which is every book published before 1923 automatically, and so that's what they focus on, books before 1923. I would say 80 to 90 percent of the books I look for that were published before that time are on that website. And there are others. Google has done them too, but that's the big one. That's also the website that does the historic, 
they have something called the Wayback Machine for any of those who <laughs> liked uh, Mr. Peabody. And that is where you can look at a URL. You can look on a calendar and it circles what dates that it had saved that the uh, website. And you can go back anytime and see what that website looked like. So the one I was saying that might have disappeared, you would use the Wayback Machine, go back to a date that, and sometimes you have to go back several dates. It might capture it and it's already been taken down. You go back to a date and then that's where you get to see it. I don't know how the, the terabyte, well, terabytes, way beyond that, that they have saved old websites. Uh, JSTOR, which you usually get through local libraries, does scholarly journals on history, well, on everything. You name it, they've got, they've got thousands of journals. National Archives, obviously, because it's the National Archives, any federal records. And I put the Quaker records here, the U, U, New York Yearly Meetings, which is, this is a free website. The reason why I put that in here is people don't realize for Quaker records, uh, we are in the New York Yearly Meeting. So all the records of Vermont, if you're a Quaker, go to the yearly meeting in New York. There's a few on the east side here that get caught up in the New England one, but almost all of the Quaker records for Vermont are in New York. And I mention this because they've actually gone through and made an index to um, records of admission, moving from one Quaker meeting to another, and uh, marriages and deaths in those records, and it's all online for free. And then, let's see, oh, the last one was Vermont Digital Newspaper Project, and some of those feed into these other databases I've showed, but at least there, that URL, you can actually go look and say, oh, wait a minute, did Tunbridge have a newspaper in this time? Can, should I even be looking for this? It will actually let you know all the newspapers that were ever published in Vermont, and roughly <laughs> ranges if they could figure it out. And, the result of that project was they microfilmed, and this was, it ended a few years ago, but no one does microfilming anymore, but they microfilmed everything they found. They tried to make one complete run from a variety of sources in the state, and that set of microfilm is housed at the Vermont State Law Library in Montpelier. So any newspaper that is in Vermont that is known to exist, a microfilm copy will be there of the entire state. And, that's a, and that URL gives you a list of what those are. So, any questions? Yes? Sir, what about using DNA? Okay. Huh? Question of DNA. DNA is useful, especially when you're not finding records that will help you and there are many, many kinds of tests, DNA tests. Mitochondrial DNA, which just does the mother's, 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 mother's line, and, and you can see how close you are related to somebody else. There's the Y chromosome one, which just does the male line, so your surname line. And there's the, the one that's commonly used in genealogy is called autosomal. It's all one word, autosomal. And that does a different set of DNA that changes, uh, a section of the DNA that changes uh, only slightly each generation, so you can tell by the variation how close you can be. You can tell first cousins, second cousins, third cousins, th that kind of thing. So that's the one you'd want uh, if you want to see if you're related to somebody, you know, living or recently living, and then those Y chromosomes or the mitochondrial, or those are ones that, you know, I want to find related to Priscilla Mullins. Does somebody else have a mitochondrial descent from her, such as my father? Which is a hard thing to do. That's the hard one to do because in genealogy, or, or in, in records, the thing that you, that is the hardest to find out is the mother's maiden name. So the mitochondrial DNA is all, that is the line it takes. The mother's 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 mother. So it's very hard to do. Yes? Can you get DNA from uh, hair that's in the... So the question is, where can you get DNA from? Normally what they do is a cotton swab in the cheek. I mean, a dead person's hair. You know? Oh, a dead person. 
You've been watching CSI and all of those. Haven't you? <laughs> so, I'm not a scientist. I can't give you all the particulars on this, but you generally, for hair, you have to have the root, the bulb at the end. That is where the genetic material is. That one I happen to know. I don't know all of it. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Is the I was playing with doing the ancestry one. Is that one going to give me some information if I spend the money? So ancestry. The DNA. Oh, the DNA yeah. ancestry. Um, yeah, that's pretty good. The largest one is ftdna, so familytreedna.com. That's the largest genealogical database there is. And that's what I did mine in at the time. The one that's growing, of course, is Ancestry because, and they're the second largest one now. And that's because they're the big elephant in the room. They have the resources and they have the reach to, to let people know about it. And that one's growing. And the other big one that's popular is 23andMe. It's 23 chromosomes is what they're talking about. So 23andMe is the other one. And it's and, A-N-D, spelled out, 23andMe.com. But there's also, and I'm falling short on this, there is a free website, because they also don't share data, which, of course, genealogists generally want to share data. So... There is another website, and you can probably Google it, that you can load, upload your data. Because you can download, from any of these sites, you can download the ones and twos and all that kind of stuff for your chromosomes. And you can upload it to this site. And so everyone, I've uploaded my stuff there, so I can match people on 23andMe or Ancestry.com. Because it's where everybody goes to load their data. So... Yes, there's one way in the back. I was just wondering about the microfilm <clears throat> and the uh, old, those kinds of records. I thought there was a deterioration problem, and what are these institutions doing about that? Okay, the question is, uh, the stuff that's, that's been captured on microfilm, most of the microfilm that was used up until recently, because they basically stopped making it, was guaranteed to last a hundred or more years. And what they do in Salt Lake City, I've been inside what they call the mountain, the granite mountain, and they routinely check their microfilm to make sure it's not deteriorating. And if they find it's deteriorating, they just recopy it onto another one. You lose some, some uh, value in how, how uh, well the image is captured, but they just redo it on new state-of-the-art microfilm and make it last another hundred years. That's one reason why I think a lot of things are being digitized. So once it's digitized, the only issue is making sure that it's in more than one place because, you know, if, say, all the library was in on this laptop and I was drinking water and I happened to do that, you're out of, you're out of luck. So always have backups of that. And all the big sites do. New England Historic, Ancestry, Family Search, they all do. So, yes? Well, Ancestry.com, I understand, is done through the Mormon no. church. No? No. No. But they did start all of that in their collection of their genealogy. And I've used some of that, and I've been told also it's not all correct. That, But a Mormon has to go in to correct it. Uh, my family, I'm not, but my family was Mormon, so right. that's my So the site that is run by the Mormon Church is familysearch.org. Okay. That library that I showed you, the biggest right. one, is also <laughs> run by them. And uh, one thing I can tell you if people are uncomfortable with that, religion is not allowed to be discussed. They're, they're, they're very conscious of that. So they run that website and familysearch.org, right. which is free. And the church pays for that site to be there. They, they, spend, they spend more money than the federal government does preserving genealogical records for the country. Right. Well, every country. Um, as far as correcting it, uh, a lot of these databases you can't easily correct stuff. Ancestry lets you correct their 
index a little bit. Any HGS will let you correct stuff, but you have to send it in and they correct it. Um, you might think that it's Mormon because a lot of the people who are higher up in Ancestry.com are Mormon because it's in Provo, Utah. Well, I was told it was by my family. Yeah, no, it's... I'm at Marriott Hotel. <laughs> Marriott's uh, uh, a Mormon family. But it's, it's genealogy in that way. So, well, one way you can actually tell, for instance, so Vermont has civil <laughs> unions and then had gay marriages. Well, gay marriages are all over now. Vermont um, chose Ancestry to do their digitizing of their vital records. Those cards that we saw there, those were all done from the project that the state signed with Ancestry to produce. And Ancestry just filmed them all. Uh, and it was a, up to 2008. So in Vermont, you can actually have access to vital records of anybody in Vermont up to 2008 online. And it's free, by the way. Your local library, and I don't know if you have the information on it, any local library can get access to that because that was part of the contract that the state did that the libraries can have access to that part of Ancestry.com. <laughs> and I don't know how you do it. The state has a place where you can find out that. And uh, so they just did everything. These databases, the, the, the three main databases are Ancestry.com, FamilySearch.com, uh, .org, and New England and American Ancestors.org. And as of about two years ago, they started sharing databases. A lot of, there are unique things on each one of them, but the big databases, like the Vermont Vital Records, are actually being shared among them. So, when it first went up on Family Search, I went and searched for these civil unions, knowing the issue. Civil unions weren't in the index. They are there on, online, and if you know how to get to them, you can get to them. But they're not online. But they are on Ancestry. Yeah. And they are on New England Historic, and that's the mm. one that has the best index for Vermont Vital Records. Yes? Can you explain, though, I think maybe a little more detail about the difference between the records that the church films versus the materials the individual families post that are available that may or may not mm. have errors? Yes, so... There, a lot of the digitized stuff that's going up is actually government records. The sources, the primary sources that we were talking about earlier, that's what's going up for the most part. In some of these indexes like the IGI, there's also uh, Ancestral File, which was another one from the Family History Library. Those generally had indexes to the family stuff that people submitted. They were some of the first ones that... so. You did work on a, on a genealogical database. You uploaded it to their site. You did too. You did too. You did too. No filter. Just gets uploaded. So quality, all over the place. As a matter of fact, lots of crap. And as long as you know how to evaluate it and you learn that over time, these are great sources because so many people have uploaded. The, the biggest ones are on Family Search and Ancestry.org, and that might be the thing that you were getting with Ancestry.org. Those things can't get changed, but there are millions and millions of entries, and th I've, I've seen certain ones, because they don't try to combine them, I've seen, oh, six or seven on one person. That's, you know, born in 1900, and there'll be six or seven different entries for them. So those are the things that you have to be more suspect on. The IGI actually is, it's an index, the interesting thing, it was an index half of that stuff and half of primary sources. So you had to actually look at the coding in the index to see, did it come from the primary source or did it come from somebody's uploaded data? Yes, sir? I'm doing research uh, on family from 1630 to 1750. Uh, is there any reason for me to go on site uh, into, into town? I do online. You can do a lot online. You can do a lot. So this project that I'm doing on early settlers of Vermont. Okay, I live in Boston now. And the library I use is the New England Historic because it's so good for all of New England. 
I go in there one day a week to do things. Mm -hmm. Mainly what I do is to look at books published after 1922, their humongous manuscript collection, and some of the microfilm that just hasn't been digitized yet. That's what I go there to do. The bulk of what I do, as, as I jokingly say, I do it in my bunny slippers at 2 a.m. You know, you just, you just can do it from home. If you have, I mean, I spend hundreds of dollars a year to belong to these different databases, but I also have you know, like the ultimate subscription. There's usually many tiers of what you can see. Ancestry has three or four tiers. And I've got the top tier, just like I do with all the others, because I mean, I'm using it every day, and you wouldn't need to do that. Mm -hmm. But what can you do? You can do most. You can do tier one, most of tier one, from your home. And, and somebody was saying with ancestry. Oh, well, you're talking about ancestry DNA, but ancestry, they did. Uh, I'm guessing it's around 50% of Vermont probates are now online on ancestry. Um, this county, both districts are done and online. Orange County. So Randolph uh, and Bradford, the Eastern District's Bradford. Um, those are online, but what's online mainly for Vermont that they did is they've been going through to microfilm, uh, to digitize things again, or things that they didn't do before. And one thing that the Mormons didn't do the first time around was digitize the file papers. So most people, when you're doing genealogy, you use the, the record books, you know, the books that they open up and they hand write in the will or the administration. And not everything that was handed into the court got written into the book. The papers, the file papers, that's what they just digitized. And that's anything that came into the court that still survives, that's what got digitized. And you know that's kind of all over the place because the next district down, which is uh, Windsor, Springfield, what's the northern one? Hartford. Hartford District, they don't have any of those papers before 1860, 1870. All their early papers are gone. And, but the southern one, they have them back to the 1700s. The original wills going in, so you can see actual signatures. It's those kind of records, probate records and other court records, that you can actually get signatures of your ancestors. Because the original documents are still there. And they're digitizing those. So, did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> yes, sir. Have you uh, had any uh, involvement with uh, Quebec? Yes, I have French Canadian ancestry as well. Okay. Like a lot of Vermonters do. Okay, and how did you make up with that? The issue with doing, you're talking about French Canadian ancestry versus yeah. Anglo. Yes. Yeah. Because the interesting thing is, French Canadians were coming down, and at the same time, New Englanders were heading up into the eastern townships. Eastern townships used to be English. It's now all French Canadian, but it used to be English. So the, below the river is a lot of uh, New England ancestry. The issue there is generally getting from New England to there. Once you find somebody in a record there, they use the Catholic recording processes where, so for a marriage, it would say, you know, John Doe, the son of such and such from this parish, Mary, so and so, the daughter of these people from this parish. Well, if it was here in the US, if it was here in Vermont, it would say, you know, John Doe, born here, uh, Mary, so and so, you know, you get a lot less data. So once you get to the right place, you can generally go back in, in French Canada, in the church records. I'm trying to think, it's a very recent year. 1940s, 1950s is when they started using civil records, like what we've always used here. That became the official way to record vital records in Quebec. Before that, church. And they all were supposed to follow the French Catholic process. So the Protestant church records read not quite as good as that, but much better than the Protestant churches down here. True. And there's, so there's two sets. With most large uh, 
systems of, of church records, they usually send a duplicate copy into the central repository. So there's two sets in Quebec. And I always get, I always forget which is which. Drouin, microfilm, Drouin Institute, and they're called the Drouin Films, filmed one of those. Loiselle filmed the other one. One of them's on Ancestry, the other one is on Family Search. Okay. So, and there's a lot of overlap. So if you don't, if you think you've got somebody up there and you're not finding them and you're on Family Search, go to Ancestry because it might be in the other database. Because you know, they might have sent the record up to to Montreal, but then the local record got lost. You know, they're in little booklets. They're usually like eight pages, folded paper, and they put a little thread in the spine, and they would keep those. And then they would bind those when they had enough. That's how they created those things. But you can't even see them. They won't even let you see them. The originals? My grandfather was born there in mm -hmm. the township. Yep. And I've done all the genealogy back with his parents, grandparents, etc. But try to get the records now. Even with the historical societies up there, yep. they can't get them. I have never seen an original, but the microfilms that I'm talking about that got digitized and put online are microfilms of the originals. So you're not touching the original, no. but you're seeing a photographic image of it. So in a sense, you're seeing it unless there's an issue with the way it's worded or something peculiar that you can only tell by the original. But you should be able to get all that stuff online. It depends how recent the event you're talking about is? 1800s. But when in the 1800s? 1830s. Oh yeah, that, you, should, you should be able to see all of that. They created a master index to everything up to 1830, and that was, I had one ancestor, oh, excuse me, maybe it was 1825. I have one ancestor who was born in 1830, came down to Vermont, and it was a corrupted name. I knew it was a corrupted name. I wasn't sure how it was supposed to be. And I could not find it, and it was just past a master index. That's not true anymore because those two databases that went online, they go up into the late 1800s. So they sh he should be in one or the other of those databases now. Whether the indexing is good enough is another story. So my instance is Seams. Um, any of you from Sharon? Nobody's from Sharon? Seamses were from Sharon, and then they moved down to uh, West Windsor, Brownsville. And I knew Seams. Uh, he was French-Canadian. All the records said he was French-Canadian, but of course Seams is not a very French-sounding name. Mm -hmm. And the obvious choice was Couture, a seamster. <laughs> and Couture is a very common French Canadian name. So that was no help to me. It ultimately ended up a colleague of mine who knew about my problem, who, who searches in, Canadian, in Quebec records all the time, actually found it. He was looking for something else. He saw the record because the guy's first name was Bruno. Not a very common <laughs> French name. <laughs> Bruno. Bruno Jonas Seams. And he found his birth. And the last name, La Couture. Rare, rare, rare variant came in in the 1750s into Canada. He, his ancestry was, uh, he was a, a French soldier in the French and Indian War, came from France, stayed, married. I descend from him. But yeah, the, the corruptions. And there are books and guides to, if this is the English version of your name, Here's some examples of what it might be in, in, in a, as a French name. So, yes? Is anybody doing anything with Abenaki or Abenaki family trees or history or anything like that? So the question is Abenaki and, well, other Indian tribes as well. Is anybody doing stuff with it? Genealogically, not so much history. There's been a lot of research of the Abenaki, and I have several colleagues who do a lot of work in Indian ancestry, and they're focused more on the tribes down in southern New England right now. 
I guess, because there's more records. But um, there is some. I'm not sure because I don't descend from any Indians. That's one thing that your DNA will tell you very quick. The markers for Indian, Native American Indian ancestry are very unique and distinct. And like many families, I had this family lore of so-and-so was an Indian. As a matter of fact, the one we think she looks like an Indian, we have on our wall. She looks like an Indian. It's not black and white, but you know, just bone structure and all that kind of stuff. She was French Canadian. But uh, so I did the autosomal, or I had my uncle do the autosomal because it's on my mother's side, and no Native American. So you can you can support or end that real quick. That is one of the few things that with DNA you know right away if that's it. because a lot of people have that, and of course descended from the Mayflower or all those other places that people want to be descended from. <laughs> That you can prove, yes. You have already gone from Bruce. Yes, I'm a Brewster descendant. And I'm Billy. Yep. You're a very small family. Very small family. Very corrupt family. <laughs> <laughs> so the head of your family got hung for murder, I mean. Oh, well, I mean, the first one was hung. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So usually, also, when you're doing. So Mayflower, the caveat with Mayflower is. Generally, if you have one Mayflower ancestor you've proven and you've got a lot of uh, shooting off the same line that you don't know where they are, odds are you've got many. They generally uh, come in groups. So my one breakthrough ancestor that was in Weathersfield and the breakthrough, anse uh, breakthrough ancestry was over in Claremont, right across the river. And once I got behind her, Six lines to the Mayflower. Because, you know, as I jokingly say, so you've got a choice to marry somebody. It's your sister or your neighbor. Which one? Because there weren't many choices. So if you're in an area, you know, southeastern Massachusetts, the chance that you're going to have Mayflower ancestry is pretty high because it, they were there for so long and the families were so large. I mean, most of the families are huge. Brewster's huge. You happen to descend from one of the very smallest. As a matter of fact, I think that's the smallest one. Well, I'm also through with the cell. Oh, okay. So uh, we're related. Well, yeah, my, car, my, car, my first car came in 1629. Yeah, they were sisters. Okay, yeah. on the Yeah. Yeah. And they founded Providence, the Bedford, and all that whole area. Yep. Yep. Then the other side of the family went, got here first. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? We're ready to. I think it's time to. Okay. We need to eat.